Matei, man, thank you so much for coming back on the show today. Super excited to have you on. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you. And first of all, I'm honored to be on here and honored to be on here for the third time. So it's, uh, it's, it's a real privilege. I know you've got some really high level guests here, some leaders in the field and just feel privileged to be, be a part of this. So thank you. But, um, yeah, about myself, I'm a strength and conditioning coach from Ljubljana, Slovenia. I'm, um, joint founder and owner of Vig Ground, um, fitness performance here in Slovenia. Uh, my brother Luca, who some of your listeners might know, um, is, um, the owner of the Big Ground facility in uh, Seattle, in the States. Um, what can I say in terms of like um, education? I've finished my master's in strength and conditioning at um, St. Mary's University Twickenham in London. And um, I've mostly been involved in, in football uh, or soccer for you guys uh, on the other side of the pond. So Big Ground is actually going into its 18th year. So it'll be wow. pretty much... Uh, it's an adult uh, <laughs> entity, in, at least in Europe. We yeah. were missing a few years in terms of the States. But yeah, um, and I've pretty much been working for, with um, football players the entire time because I was a player myself. Um, I was decent when I was growing up, you know, uh, went through levels, c came up to international level uh, at um, under 17 and then uh, also England universities team and so forth played a bit of a semi-pro just you know touched the pros a little bit as well but you know at the end it wasn't to be and then uh, I just moved into what I felt was kind of you know the logical progression I really love training um, myself and Luca we both love tra training and we were looking for something that would kind of you know give us an environment and give others an environment to train like athletes even though we weren't essentially looking to train athletes and um so, you know, like everyone, we started out with Gen Pop and soon, quite soon, uh, you know, former teammates um, would come in across and ask me to train them. And yeah, it would kind of evolve pretty organically. Um, obviously, that's, you know, kind of summing it up uh, yeah. a little bit. But yeah, so um, now these days I'm, I'm working as one of the lead um, educators on the UEFA football fitness uh, license, which is coming out next year for the National uh, Football Association here. I'm a um, head of rehab at uh, FC Bravo, which is a first division football team here in Slovenia, and um, also training people privately, like you know, um, several of the national team players, and um, then doing quite a bit of consulting and mentoring these days. So yeah, in a nutshell. And um, yeah, yeah. last but not least, I'm, I'm a dad to a four-year-old, which probably yeah. takes up most of my time. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you know, you know how that is. I, I know exactly how that is. And man, you kind of like killed my first two questions there because I was going to ask what's new. But, you know, yeah, like you said, you know, you got like the FC Bravo stuff going. Like, seems like everything is good on your end right now, man. Well, uh, it's been, you know, a, a transition after four years of working with, uh, as like head SNC and just like, you know, kind of head of everything at, uh, Olympia, which is kind of known as the top club in, in Slovenia here. I was working with the academy. So in under 19s, under 17s, I'll actually love that, but it was pretty much spending every single day on the pitch as well. Again, yeah, you know, comes with pros and cons, you know, you get a lot of insight into, you know, injury load management all that kind of stuff um but you know it's like um weekends it's a lot of time away from family and um yes. you know after four years I just decided to switch over and then had quite a few um invitations but i grabbed one that i thought was a best fit so i'm kind of like embedded with the team um yeah so the guys will come into to the gym uh, i do the strength work with them as well but i'll see the injured players on a day-to-day -day basis and um yeah it's it's great for, you know, building rapport and, and an insight into the other side, maybe, you know, the health performance continuum. So, um, yeah, I'm learning stuff every day as well, Mike. I mean, there's, uh, yeah. you know, I don't have the, the set, you know, um, return to play protocols because every injury is different. Uh, every person's yes. different and, you know, you've got certain, um, heuristics that you use, but, um, I'll, I'll just, treat everyone as an individual and you know sometimes it'll take you know you get a hammy and it's a week and same yeah. presentation another guy will be like three months so it's yeah. um, very complex for sure well that actually kind of leads right into our first line of questioning here because something that i know you and i are both passionate about is this return to play return return to sport kind of continuum and process and one of the things that we also share as well is that we've seen this both in like the private 
setting, like in our gym, but we've also seen it in a club setting working for another team. So I'd love to hear from you, like what are your experiences in those two environments and how is it different working maybe in a private setting versus working for a club? It's a really good question. I think um, there'll be a lot of practitioners out there who will identify with this. And I think the first thing you kind of have to identify is your role, right? So, okay, what am I supposed to do here in this organization? It be it privately. So if you're a uh, you know, private um, practitioner who's working with someone as an outsourced, you know, uh, rehab specialist or a SNC, I think the most important thing is transparency. You need to kind of let the um, stakeholders know what kind of load the players are under. Um, so what you did, what you intend to do, and how that fits into the bigger picture of, you know, that it's obviously different when you've got someone who's sent out to you on a long term, like ACL rehab, that's different, right? But uh, sure. in my world, you know, obviously when I was working privately, it was, and still is, right? It's, it's day to day, week to week. So um, we, we need to kind of, you know, get loads, uh, data, GPS data from the club. I'm obviously a, a big advocate of just talking to the play. How do you feel? getting subjective uh, data from them as well. Um, but mostly privately, you've just got much more time. And there are obviously financial yeah. time constraints. So, you know, someone will pay you to work one-on-one -on -one and, you know, I'll be able to go out there on the pitch. I'll be able to do like biomechanics, uh, sprint uh, speed stuff, uh, record everything, um, give them feedback. Then you, you, you move into the semi-private area. You can't really do that, you know, um, so yeah. you you're based, based, I mean, you, uh, you concentrated on, uh, the things that you can change. So in the gym, right. So maybe power, um, power strength stuff. And then no, when you're in a club, you, at least when, when I was there, and obviously I'll give some context here. We're not talking about, you know, premier league, uh, level here where you've got like 20 people who are each doing <laughs> their own thing and you can, and you know, next door to you is the data analyst analyst. You can go and talk to him and get the data. Uh, the other side of you is, is your medical team and you're like, okay, you know, can you give me this manual intervention? No, you're doing everything, right? right. You're doing everything. You're, you're doing the manual stuff. Um, <laughs> you're doing the load management. You're doing the data analysis. You're doing everything. And sometimes, you know, you might be lucky and you're working with one player. And then sometimes you've got like a slew of injuries. You've played six games over the last two weeks and there's like 10 people there in the treatment room or in the mini gym that you have. Now, yeah. these clubs, they don't have force plates. The gym is, you know, very limited to what you can do. So what are you going to do? So I think it's very important to have like the toolkit for these different scenarios. Um, and again, you know, I, I, I always try to at, at least um, have one objective um, data marker and something subjective that I work off. Um, and obviously, you know, when I'm in the private setting, I can have, you know, the force plates, I've got my, uh, VBT, um, and other stuff that I can use, but then, you know, when I'm in a different environment, then I've got to have something different, you know, but these days, um, you know, we've got smartphones and we've got, um, apps that can help us do that. So I try to combine, com combine those, both. but I would come back to, you know, identifying what your role is. And especially when taking on a new role, sitting down with the decision makers, be that you know, the first team coach or even higher up, you know, managing director or sports director. All right. Who do I report to? What is my, what are my responsibilities? Um, what is my authority? So what can I decide, you know, on, um, right. obviously I, I prefer to, to, to work as a team, even when I'm working privately to consult with people and then make a decision based on, you know, uh, the player's best interests. Yeah. I love the idea of like doing your best to define roles. And just knowing, like, again, if you're working in an NBA team or an English premier level team, they've got 15, 20 people, right? And they have team meetings that just revolve around, okay, player A, what do we need to do for them today? And medical is going to chime in and the soft tissue person, like everybody kind of has their little angle and role and hopefully they're doing a good job communicating. But in spaces like ours, you know, generally you're taking four or five jobs on, right? So like, we have a guy that's that's coming through our gym right now and you know there's bill or eric so we've got like a pt and like more of a medical side we've got me taking care of the s and c side now luckily this guy has uh, a little bit of disposable income and he's got some soft tissue stuff so we've referred him out to get some soft tissue work done but man in these kinds of environments you have to take on more than just one role and you also have to be skilled 
in a lot of different things. And that's where it's the communication process. And keep in mind, this doesn't happen overnight. Start as like an SNC coach and kind of work your way out. But just having a better understanding of all the various stakeholders and how you can help them without kind of overstepping, I think is very important. And that's something we always try and espouse. If we're doing return to play is, okay, what is Bill and Eric's job? What do they need to do? What is my job? What is Jenny, our soft tissue person? What are all of our jobs? And then how can we help each other so we're all kind of congruent in our approach versus working against each other? I would add something here. It's like also building a data set and like, you know, so, you know, you and I, I'm pretty sure we both go, you know, when we see a, a new injury or something that we haven't seen before, we'll go and look at the research and, you know, best best yeah. practice and everything. But I think the most important thing, you need to know your own team and your own context because, you know, um, the load that players have been exposed to in your setting might be completely different to what the, you know, best research says. So I think yeah. it's, it's important to, over time, build your data sets, know the players that you're working with, and then, you know, build your own best practice. You know, obviously, you know, th there will be guidelines. And, and again, I like to use heuristics and that you will use, you know, um, and obviously, you know, starting with do no harm. But, you know, I, right. I really feel it, it's important to build your own data set and then, you know, work from there in terms of like, you know, rehabbing players. I love it. So one thing that we wanted to talk about during this show was decision-making and using data to drive decision-making. So what are maybe some of the best ways that we can use technology and data to guide our decision-making? And along those same lines, how much data is enough? How much is too much? Because you and I both have access to some really cool tools, but when you first get in there, it can be overwhelming. So how do you use it? How is it valuable? And then how do you use enough so that you don't get overwhelmed or lost in the process? Okay, so that's a great question. And um, I'll actually come back to what I said before. So what is my role in this uh, scenario? Okay, because someone needs to, to be the gatekeeper. Now, in certain instances, I was the gatekeeper. So I have to decide which data will go through the filter. Now, I I used to so in the academy setting, I used to get the GPS data. Um, I did some force plate analysis on a weekly basis with the players. And that was, again, my own data. Um, and then Furthermore, at the time, we didn't really have VBT data and we did subjective questionnaires. So I had the RPE data. Um, deciding basically, first of all, what's valid, uh, because some of the RPE data at the time, I would say was only valid because I went really deep into the relationship with the players. They would give me like mm. numbers that I think, you know, um, most practitioners would say, well, you know, I, I don't think that was a five, don't think that was a seven, but I tracked that over time. And I knew exactly when someone gave me a five, who would usually give me like a three, there was something there, just uh, opportunity mm. to discuss things with the player and look under the yes. hood. And then obviously I had some objective data from the force plate to back that up. And also from the GPS data, and, you know, so you've ran a whole lot, you know, you just, your, your sprint distance is, uh, is up. So, you know, how are you hammies, uh, feeling and all that kind of stuff. So um, I would say, again, depending on where you are in the chain of, uh, of decision making and communication, I think that's really important here. For myself right now, I use the um, force plate data. Um, now in return to play, that will be um, weekly or fortnightly, really, you know, once every two weeks, I'll, I'll test players. I don't like to test them too often, because that way, sometimes, it causes anxiety in the players. Uh, they feel, you know, because they do have the visuals, they're like, oh, am I up or am I down? And they, you know, you need to give them context. So I always just give them like maybe very little feedback. And then after the session, we'll be like, look, you know, this is what's happening. Sometimes I'll say, look, you know, we're, we're in a period of, you know, overload, eccentric overload. Your numbers are going to go down. Your performance is going to go down. It's supposed to go down, right? right. And just making the players feel good where they're at in the return to play. And then again, depending on who's on the other side of the phone, you know, so I'll share some of the data with the physios because it will maybe be meaningful to them. The head coach, I don't think he really cares about, you know, the eccentric right. breaking impulse, but I'll try to, you know, convey that in layman's terms or something that was, is meaningful to him. All right. So, you know, we're, we're a bit away from him being able to like, decelerate 100% and then change it, change the direction. So maybe, you know, maybe 
we won't do like small sided games yet, even like, you know, when, when they're the, um, the floater. So, you know, giving, giving yeah. context, of how far away are we? Because I don't like to give timelines, but I'm like, okay, so, you know, this is what we're doing now. We're, we're avoiding, um, we're avoiding players coming on to us, but it's all anticipated and trying to build, you know, kind of context to where they can come onto the pitch, play small sided games, large sided games, friendlies, and then uh, and so forth. Yeah. Well, the thing that you mentioned there early on in, in that was that you have multiple data sets that you're tracking, right? You're not solely relying on one. And I think that's really smart too, because now you have multiple things that you can make your decision making off of, because you know, as well as I do, sometimes you just have an off day right? Like one thing is just off, but everything else is going up. I always would try and like pitch that to an athlete. Like, look, all the trends are going in the right direction, right? So don't put too much stock in this one thing that might be down or a little bit off. So I think that's really important. But then like you alluded to as well, giving them this like really good rationale for if their numbers are down, hey, maybe you want them to be down at that point, right? Maybe you're chasing an adaptation that they don't have that long-term could become more preventative for them. So helping them understand the process, I think, is so valuable. And like you alluded to, you have really good relationships with your athletes. I'd like to think that I do as well. I think that's part of it, is helping educate them as to not just the training process, but in our case, the return to play process and how to come back better and hopefully stay healthy the next time they get back out there. Definitely. And also, you know, sometimes the players will be anxious about you testing them because they'll feel, okay, so, you know, they know there's there, there there's something there they're, they're slightly injured and they'll be worried about but i'll say look you're not going to be able to play and then i'm just going to have a conversation look you know don't worry about the numbers you know we don't have to like you know go to the coach and say like there's no way you can play but you know this is me we, we're trying to protect you not just for this game yes. but you know your health we we want to have you on the team for the next like 10 games we've got a really heavy congested uh, fixture list over the two next two months you know why would you want to like risk that by playing this saturday um because you know mike you and i both know we can't predict injury but we can yeah. we can we can raise i guess some concerns in relation to some generic testing then some more specific testing and you know Sometimes we'll even go, you know, out on the pitch if certain things look right and we'll go, look, you know, I want to see a sprint change direction before we, we go into game situations. And obviously we'll, we'll build up to that. We, we never take a, uh, make a decision, you know, so Friday you're just doing a gym session and Saturday you're playing. So we're always, you know, right. building up and getting feedback from, from the skills coaches and the, and the head coach as well before we introduce uh, players to live games. For sure. Okay. So I think this makes sense to talk about now. Let's talk about KPIs. Everybody likes, likes to talk about KPIs, key performance indicators. What are some of the most important ones for you in the soccer space? And Matei, I really want to say football because I know <laughs> it's football. But as soon as I start saying football, everybody here in the States is going to think American football. So I'm going to say soccer. That's fine. So what are the most important KPIs for you in the soccer space? And then maybe a second part to that. How do they shift or how do they change between your off season and your in season training periods? All right. Another good question. And um, I don't know if this is what people want to hear, but for me, the most important KPI is actually seeing the players play the game. And I watch mm -hmm. all the games for, for our guys. I obviously can't watch all the games for all the guys that I, uh, that I train, but I sure. do like sure. every weekend I go through the statistics, how much they played. Um, you know, did they score? Did they assist? I know those numbers, right? Uh, I know if they're injured. What, I'm, I'm on the phone. I'm on the WhatsApp getting, uh, you know, feedback from them. Uh, essentially for our team, I'm looking at the game. If not 90 minutes, I'll look at, um, because we, we have an, uh, online platform where I can download and look at the, uh, specific, you know, actions and, uh, yeah. you know, the snippets of, uh, of game time and I'll, I'll look at certain people who are, you know, at risk, I guess, who, who've just come back from, from injury, have got their first minutes after quite a long time. Uh, and I'll look at that because qualitatively that, that's for me the most important things, you know, that the gym is, you know, secondary or even tertiary, but obviously, you sure. know, I, I need to have some numbers and then, um, in season. Um, we will look at, you know, readiness stuff. So we've got, uh, our output units to, uh, to measure RSI for the drop jumps. That will give us something, you know, basically on a daily basis, how we'll adjust training, uh, on the force plates. 
will will you uh, look at stuff like um, time to peak power, uh, eccentric uh, braking impulse, um, velocity of takeoff. So those are some of the parameters I'll, I'll look at from from the force plates, um, and then I always look at relative motion. You know, it's something I guess that Bill and yourself instilled in me as well. Yeah. But you know, f- for me, I know each player when they walk in the door. I I know you know uh, because I've tested them pre season and I'm during the season. I'll have a bandwidth. You know, some guys have like literally you know five degrees internal rotation, and I'm like, look, you know, we need. To, to you know, address this before we go onto any other performance, you know, uh, yeah. elements or, or measures. So I'm looking at performance measures, but I'm definitely looking at you know um, health measures, if if you want to call them that, um, because I think you know as soon as we give them a little bit more space, you know, um, be it external or internal rotation, um, we've just got more bandwidth to display you know the performance uh, that we want to see them. And then off season, I'm obviously, you know, not looking at them uh, on the pitch. So in that scenario, um, what I'm really big in these days is uh, deceleration. So Mm -hmm. um, tracking their deceleration numbers. So RFD, uh, uh, we're also doing a curvy linear um, sprint and uh, braking test uh, during the off season. Uh, along with uh, obviously force plate data, so early on in the in the off season, I'm focusing more on the deceleration braking part. So I'll look at the eccentric duration, um, braking duration, or uh, contraction times. Um, how big they are, how much force can they essentially um, um, withstand within that time frame? And we're looking yep. to obviously shorten that and increase the force. Uh, And then over time, we'll look at more concentric measures. Some of those uh, I already uh, alluded to just before. And we're always tracking the relative motion. So for me, for the uh, football soccer players, it's always hips, man. It's it's all in the hips. So ER, IR, and uh, yeah, so um, hip extension is is, is huge for them. For sure, for sure. When you talk about your braking stuff, what are you looking at there? Like drop landings? What are are your your go-tos? So we've got different things, right? So we're, we're, yes, and I actually thought the episode with Matt that you had, um, he's yeah, more from the basketball sp- sharp, space, dude. but I, I, I really love that. So, I, you know, I'd probably echo some of the stuff that uh, he would say in terms of the force plate numbers, but I like to give a horizontal co- component. So we're doing, uh, obviously, progressing 10 meter, 20 meter, 30 meter sprints with maximum decel, uh, obviously building up to those. But so I want to yep. see basically how long they need or in terms of uh, distance and time to stop uh, and then obviously change direction. So um, Damien Harper is a, a leading researcher yeah. in this space and I've, I've uh, you know, gone through a lot of his work and I use uh, a lot of his stuff and, you know, I'm, I'm starting to implement uh, laser guns now because it's just much easier to get a valid measure of uh, how quickly players decelerate uh, and break. So I think that's huge for for off-season work, and then on top of that, then obviously building the speed stuff, uh, acceleration, and then uh, max speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damian Harper's on the wish list to get on the show. So if somebody, uh, <laughs> if somebody listens to this that knows him, uh, give him a shout out. Say I'd love to bring him on because I'm fascinated by that as well. I have not dug as much into that, but it's definitely something I want to add to the to the testing battery. I would, I would add one more thing, uh, Mike, because I know we're talking like, you know, a lot of the measures, which are obviously associated with numbers, but I'm, I'm really huge on quality. So I film pretty much every single rep when we do like accelerations, decelerations and max speed stuff. I film it because I'm, I'm not Dan Path, even though I've, you know, been invented (laughs) by him, but I need to slow things down and look at, you know, what, what am I seeing? You know, so that penultimate breaking step, you know, deceleration, I'm definitely looking at that, especially in the return to play, um, gives us a lot of clues at how, you know, someone's guarding that injured leg. And, um, it's obviously, you know, if you look at it, if you look at it on the force plate, it, it might show up. But it's just different because you're, you're using single leg stuff, you're using bilateral stuff, but it's got pretty much a vertical uh, displacement component whereby, you know, when you're forcing someone to go like into into a maximum braking um, 
phase during like a 10 meter 20 meter acceleration and then deceleration they you know they're gonna they're gonna guard their you know what they feel is is at risk and you get a lot of insights with uh, qualitative data so uh, i.e video yeah no i agree uh it's funny lee taft told me the same thing at one point i was like lee dude how do you like see all this stuff he's like mike i still record stuff i don't see everything Mm. i still use my phone i was like oh okay there's my permission slip and i started videoing a lot more and it definitely made me faster one other thing while we're on this topic because i think this is fascinating you talked about like the penultimate step when we're talking about breaking one of the things that i have found when we do use force plates right again we're kind of chasing and looking at different things vertical versus horizontal but one of the things that I found, we talked about this before the show, is that a lot of times this stuff doesn't come out in, say, a squat jump or maybe even a CMJ. But when you start doing like a rebound CMJ where they have to do things multiple times for max intent, that's when some of this stuff starts to show up. And that's where you start to see these asymmetries. So I feel like a lot of times you just have to dig deeper. You know, everybody wants the easy answer, but sometimes you just got to dig a couple layers deeper to really figure out, OK, is this person really feeling confident in this injured limb or not i just add one thing on that because it was interesting i just had like rebound single leg uh counter movement like rebound jumps with uh, a couple of uh, players the other week and i think what's important here is that you you understand how competent the player is or the athlete is with the actual test because sometimes yes um, for sure they, the first time they do that test I'm not really looking that much into the numbers because they're absolutely shocking, you know, when they go into yeah. the single leg rebound, right? I actually had yeah. a couple of people, you know, falling off the plates and just like, wow, like, <laughs> all right, you know, we're shutting it down, you know, g- giving you right. some extra um, extra reps before you actually take the test. But I think it's important to understand how competent uh, uh, an athlete is with a certain test before um, you can interpret the, uh, the data. Um, yeah, so for sure. I love it. I love it. Okay. So I think the KPIs are obviously important, but it's like a starting point, right? If we're being honest, this is a starting point. Now, how do we use those KPIs to drive better programming? Because I think that's where the rubber really meets the road. Well, again, you know, now we're depending, depending whether we're talking off season or in season, but during the in season, you know, I th- We've, we've got to remember, you know, football, soccer is a culture that doesn't, you know, like to get in the gym too much. So, you know, in sure. my world, I've been able to get them into the gym like twice a week, uh, which I think is a Great. result pretty much. Um, yeah. And then we're, we're usually focusing on like just longer contraction times. It'll be kind of like quasi max effort um, on a match day plus um, three normally uh, yeah. in the gym. Um, we'll use a lot of like holding, uh, ISOs in, in that scenario stuff. That's we're talking at team level because stuff that's easy to implement for when you're training like 20 people, obviously when yeah. you're doing one-on-ones, semi-private stuff, then, then it's easier to, uh, we're doing, you know, stuff on, on the exafly and, and, uh, other modalities as well. But we definitely have something, uh, that resembles like, uh, a quasi max effort day and then a dynamic effort day. And then it will really depend on some of the measures that we get for the daily readiness for, for the respective players, you know, how much we want to push it. And to be honest, look, Mike, during the season, we're microdosing pretty much everything because, you know, we can't really afford to go hard too hard in the gym get them sore and then you know they don't perform uh, on the pitch so you know we might be able to to go after certain adaptations with some um bench players for sure and obviously with people who we're bringing back from injury we can actually you know get them better at certain certain things um but you know most of the time in season we're just you know kind of microdosing and off season again you know usually it's a three-day split uh, where we're going max effort, dynamic effort, repetition effort, and we're just um, basically repeating that because, um, and I, I brought this up in the presentation for the IFAST you, but, you know, my real reality is that um, the off season here in Europe for soccer is, you know, four to six weeks max, right? That's what Crazy. you have available. So how are you going to, you know, periodize that? I go into like <laughs> uh, so-called sprint blocks, like two to three week, weeks, um, where I'd go, um, pretty much, you know, eccentric or deceleration first two or three weeks or early foot contacts, if you want, then, you know, kind of max propulsion phase, uh, and then, uh, late propulsion 
and then acceleration. So that's the way. And then I try to kind of recycle that during the season, really, to be honest. Uh, yeah. So that way I'm kind of making sure that the player is robust enough to withstand all of the, you know, elements that everything that's being thrown against them. Because obviously soccer uh, is is a sport where you can't just focus on top speed and then, you know, um, you switch the brakes off. So I'm just kind of recycling that uh, during the course of the season, really, uh, to be honest. Yeah. It's so hard. And in your world, like I've been lucky. Uh, the shortest off season I had ever was like three and a half, four weeks. Cause a guy played in the MLS cup and then got called into January camp. So he had legitimately three and a half weeks. He's like, okay, well, what do I do? Oh, well, we're going to have to do a little bit of everything. Cause as soon as he finished January camp, he had to report to his team's training camp. But I think that's, that's important to note when you have those kinds of situations as well is that your only goal is to try and set them up so they have a healthy preseason, right? And sometimes people are like, how do we get them ready for, no, you're thinking too far ahead, right? And especially one thing that I do love about soccer, at least in my experience, people are very good about building things up in a sequential fashion. So your only goal in that preseason is to get them ready for training camp. And then in training camp, you know, you might practice three weeks and then you have a friendly where you play 45 minutes and then you know, over the course of the next three weeks, then you build up to 90 minutes. But even still, I know you've seen this at like to get to peak fitness level in soccer, it, you need four to six weeks of high level competition before you ever get there. So now you got to think it's like a 12 week process to get all the way up to match fitness. You don't have to be there day one of preseason or training camp. Look, I'm looking at stuff that I can really impact in four to six weeks, right? Um, and mm -hmm. I'm all, also thinking, okay, what is the stuff that I won't be able to do during the season? So yes. if you yes. look, take that into account, I'm going to go heavy on the eccentric overload. I'm going to go heavy, obviously, progressively on the plyos. Yeah. Okay. I'm yeah. going to go, I'm going to try to get a little bit of max strength with indicated, you know, lifts, obviously. I'm not going to crush yep. them and compress and compress the, the shit out of them. <laughs> And, and that's pretty much it. I'm going to, and, and I'm trying to bring them even during the uh, off season, getting them outside to work on the mechanics, even if it's not maximum effort. Um, that is, you know, acceleration with, with dragon sleds, um, max velocity. We're looking at posture. We're looking at, you know, uh, foot contacts and then change of direction and deceleration. That's what we're looking at. So, you know, quant quantitatively in the gym and then, what can we also do qualitatively on, on the pitch, you know, before, before it all goes haywire, because once you're in, in <laughs> camp, right. I mean, it, you, you're, you're doing, you know, you're playing uh, soccer all the time. Right. So, and then yeah. during the season, like I said, it's pretty much a, a top up thing um, in terms of uh, and microdosing in terms of these um, uh, qualities. Yeah. I love it. Okay. What tech excites you in the future and why? Well, first of all, like, you know, I sometimes get overwhelmed with tech because um, I was actually a, yeah. an early adopter and now I'm not anymore. So I actually had, uh, you still remember the push bands? Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think I got them now. I might tell a lie, but I think it was like 2008, no, 2008, 2010. I'm not sure when they started. It was in their first year. I went straight to the Toronto, um, you know, headquarters. I think there was two guys oh, yeah. there at the time working and he gave, you know, I bought like three sets of those push bands off. Like, great, this is going to be, you know, it's going to open up my world, you know. And, you know, I, I got some buying from from the players. It was great. But then, you know, I, I'll never forget a session, you know, put the bands on them. I actually programmed the, the session on the on the app and the Bluetooth's not working. And then I'm like, <laughs> and they're like, you know, what are we doing? What are we doing? And then like, yeah, after 10 minutes, I'm like, you know, guys, get the straps off. We're just, you know, we're going, you know, five sets of three, push presses, whatever, you know, with max intent. Right. And why I say that is because, you know, I think it's important to have the tech validated first for people to get exposed to this and do some research as well. Is, does it work? Yeah. Is it valid? You know, is it reliable? But these days we've got like, you know, we've got a wealth of information and a couple of things that really, really uh, excites me is um, so the biomechanic uh app so view motion is uh mm. i think an australian company and they they have teamed up with altis and uh, speedworks in in the uk 
So um, I'm using some of some of that because it's it's incredible what it spits out. I mean, you go, you set up some cones, you go into either you know uh, acceleration, max velocity, or change of direction, and you'll get a report back. Uh, you'll get like you know your step rate, step frequency, uh, strike length. I mean, it's it's amazing, and you can actually take those things and go into the gym and you know focus on that impact that and you will get a change you know i, I truly believe that and um a couple another company it's called plantiga i think i think mm. that jordan's actually a, a founder or at least involved yes. in some sort i think um and i've already spoken to them and you know maybe for christmas someone will get me a, a pair of plantigas <laughs> but i think i think it's it's really exciting because it you know it's live information on 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 your foot contacts on your yes. you know again stride length stride frequency how much uh, force you're putting into the ground it's it's really exciting stuff but again i would come back to okay what is the data but then do I have someone to interpret the data for me or can I interpret the data? Can I act meaningfully, you know, with that data to, yeah. to improve uh, their stride length or, you know, how they change direction? I think that's, that's very important, but I think this space is, uh, is something to look out for. And, you know, you know, we're getting older, but I think we're, uh, we're, we're going to have to keep up with the tech if we want to, you know, Absolutely. basically serve our players best. Yeah. That's something I really try and espouse. Uh, I don't think it's hard with the younger generation. Uh, I think just tech is kind of baked into their lifestyle. You know, they've had phones and iPads and all kinds of cool gizmos since they were little. But yeah, coaches our age, if you're in your, you know, late 30s, early 40s, maybe you're not as open minded about this stuff. Look, if you're going to be in this game for 20, 30 years, it's only going to get bigger, broader. There's only going to be more tech. So at some point, I think you just need to dive in and get comfortable with it. You know, it never, maybe it's never like your main thing, but it's like, uh, it's like any other kind of related field, right? Like I'm never going to be Bill Hartman when it comes to physical therapy, but I need to know enough about it to where he and I can have good conversations. Same thing with, you know, the sports tech side. Like if you're not at least somewhat comfortable with the space, what they're doing, the information they're trying to pull, I think you're leaving yourself at a disadvantage. I would say I'll definitely agree with that. But again, there's a caveat to that. So I've seen, I go into some gyms these days. Um, these are like, you know, young-ish practitioners. Um, you know, uh, I would say very technically um, proficient. Uh, and yes. they've got their, you know, VBT set up. They've got their force plates set up. Um, you know, they're trying to track everything. And I just feel like it just slows the session down so much. There's no, yeah. you know, they're, they're spitting out numbers all the time. And What's missing is AI, and I don't mean artificial intelligence. I mean actual <laughs> interaction. Okay. Yeah. So speaking, <laughs> speaking to the players. How did that feel? Okay. What, what, how are you going to take that into into the game or into training? And um, I've seen, and I've seen it in in my sessions. I've tried to, you know, implement. Um, you know, we'll start with the um, output for the daily readiness, which is great because I get subjective, um, you know, so RP data, wellness data on the spot and I'll have a conversation and then we'll do the RSI's, the drops, jumps, and then we'll go on to the force plates. And then, you know, and I'm 30 minutes into the session, Mike, and, you know, people are standing around and waiting for me. You know, obviously, look, it's, it's a logistics thing. I could have an intern help me out and everything, but sure. I need to have that, time that moment after i do something to have a conversation with a player because you know that minute or two minutes is going to be huge when i'm reporting to the head coach or you know when they come back from the gym because i build trust and you know trust is basically the biggest currency there is in this game i feel yeah no i love that man okay switching gears a little bit i got a couple kind of off the board questions that i'm interested in hearing your thoughts on number one Talk to me about the role of the consultant strength and conditioning coach. All right. So again, I think context matters here. Um, you know, there are great practitioners who, who basically, you know, live as consultants one, once they um, give their life to the game, I guess, you know, um, I would say um, someone like Martin Bouchard, you know, who's been in, yeah. in, 
high level of academia and also embedded in teams like for, you know for 15 years now he can go off yeah. and and uh and consult and i think that's great i think for us um mere mortals though it will be you know consulting the the teams and organizations who can't and i don't want to say afford because it's not just financially um to have you there on a daily basis i think it's actually like in terms of logistics bringing you in when they need yeah. you to improve and optimize their training or recovery or rehab process and then basically getting you back in for an audit every i don't know you know at a certain frequency right sure. um i feel i feel that that's definitely going to happen in at least in my space where teams are underfunded um we don't have you know teams with millions of euros or dollars uh on a budget and you know they they may have like um a junior snc who's just out of college or and you know may know his way around but then you know can't interpret data um doesn't you know know how to start with the rehab protocols doesn't know how to get the, the most out of his 15 minutes of the pre training um routine so uh you know with in our world we're talking like you know resets readiness you know how to individualize yeah. that part of uh, of training and you can step in and it's you know a very win-win situation where you help out the club and the practitioners and come back every uh, now and then to review um and also you know we're, we're talking about you know we're, we're past 40 now um you know we're not getting any younger and i feel obviously uh, you and me, we had a conversation about this, but, you know, prior to going on air, um, you know, we probably want to stay on the floor. We want probably want to stay on the pitch because, you know, that's our passion, but I'm pretty sure yeah. you don't want to spend like 10 hours a day on the gym floor, you know, yeah. uh, coaching anymore. So, and I think feel obviously you need to kind of build up to that. You need to deserve that. You need to, you know, um, pay your dues, but at a certain point when you've got the experience, and also you're trying to add value to people, right? And I think the consultant role is something that will definitely, it will, it will be increasing, um, I'll say at the mid range and also at the high and the low range as well of clubs uh, talking about. The, you know, the, the top clubs will always look for that 1%. They'll get the top Absolutely. guys in who feel, who they feel can make the difference. But, you know, we could make a lot of difference with, with clubs that don't have million dollar or euro budgets. And I, I feel yeah. um, even the work I've done so far with some of the clubs have got really good feedback and I don't have to be there every single day, you know, but um, I can give yeah. them feedback um, I, either in person or, uh, or online. You know, you just gave me this brilliant idea. And if you are a private business owner, you might want to take a hold of this because I can just imagine where this would be really valuable. So obviously most of the times when you hear about, Oh, performance consultant, we're thinking again, like NBA, MOS, premier league, NFL, major league baseball, huge high level consultants going into these big clubs. And that's cool. But again, for the rest of the world, maybe if you have a second or third division soccer team or, you know, whatever lower level sports or, what I have a ton of here, and I don't know if it's quite the same overseas, but there are tons of youth sports, right? Where they're starting to implement S and C, right? Maybe they want just like a preseason injury screening for kids. You know, it goes beyond just the the physical, right? Or the medical side, but they want a little bit of testing done. That could be a really cool way to infuse yourself into what they're doing, positively impact some kids. Uh, because a lot of times from what I've seen with these types of programs, they just get one program. Like if there's like a headquarters, headquarters sends down one program for all the U14 soccer players or baseball players. Well, now maybe we can have some discussions like, hey, these are the things we're seeing. Maybe we can change some things or tweak some things and ultimately make a really positive impact on the clubs and the teams that we're, we're associated with. Yeah, and we want to be educators as well, right? I mean, because we're working yeah. in this space where we have parents coming in and they're pretty much telling us what we need to do with the kids, right, in terms of physical development. And then on the other hand, you know, I'm working a lot with the uh, agents as well. Again, you know, they, they've got their own view yeah. of, you know, timelines uh, of development and all that kind of stuff. And I feel yeah. we need to be really cognizant of, of the fact that we're, you know, 
one of our primary roles as educators, when we're talking especially about young people, right? So I think this consultant slash educator piece would be very valuable and important in, uh, in the time to come for, again, you know, the organizations and clubs and entities that, you know, don't have massive budgets to work with. Yeah, I love that, man. Okay, so last one, then we'll kind of start to wrap up here. And this is totally off topic, but I think it's also important. As you've alluded to, we are both getting older and it is very much, I think, a young person's game. Fitness in general, right, is really, there's a lot of like social media influence and 20 and 30 year olds showing abs and, you know, hundreds of thousands of TikTok or Instagram viewers. So I'm interested in your thoughts on this. And I have some as well, but how can we make sure that we as coaches, we're relevant, we're financially secure, we stay healthy and happy in this profession as we age? Well, I think you just said it there, Mike. I mean, there's obviously several layers to this, but we, we need to take care of ourselves first, right? We need to stay healthy. And like the amount of coaches, and I'm not talking just um, in sports, but just like, you know, private coaches, like, you know, personal trainers who who just like knock themselves out with the amount of work they do and also training, I guess, you know, and uh, I can see them like in their late twenties, early thirties, they're already burning out. And I don't want to be one of those people. Right. So obviously for me, I like to, you know, I've set myself a standard and what I, what I like to see is when I, when I'm coaching, uh, when I'm demonstrating exercises. So I want to be able to demonstrate and coach, you know, live, not just by queuing, but actually doing as well yeah. um, for some, yep. some time to come. So that's definitely important. And, you know, how can I achieve that? Well, by training regularly myself, making sure, you know, that I'm kind of walking the, the talk, basically, that I'm, you know, yeah. kind of tracking my own data, which I actually am um, more cognizant of, of some of these, you know, variables that we look for, you know, HRV, um, and sleep data and all this uh, type of stuff without obviously being overwhelmed. Um, then, you know, slowly kind of, I think for me, at least, I don't know about you, but it's, it's happens quite organically because, uh, you know, switching from mainly on the floor, on the pitch now to providing more education and, and mentorship because people have sought me out. Um, I don't know. I think they they've seen me do it, you know, more often than not live because I don't have a massive social media presence. Um, so, you know, they've, they've sought me out and uh, now I think I can deliver other uh, things to them as well. So I think finding a good balance of, um, so speaking, you definitely need to have a side gig in this business. Um, you know, I love what I do, but I think without a certain amount of income from either writing Um, presenting, um, building some type of or designing some type of online product, it's going to be difficult to maintain, you know, the level of income and um, financial freedom for ourselves in the long term, right? So we need to kind of just look at, I guess, what our toolkit is, uh, where we're best at, you know, like I already alluded to, I'm I'm more comfortable with in-person things than I am on social media. So I don't know if I'll go down the route of, um, you know, designing loads of uh, online products or although i've actually broken the ice there and uh, i've done a little bit but most probably it'll yeah. be more like speaking mentoring and and, and consulting uh, in person yeah and i think that's where you know just as we get older we all need a vision for you know i, I don't believe in like the 20 year timeline or game plan anymore that's mm-hmm. not really no. it's not really possible but at least having like a general outline okay well you know, I've obviously thought about, okay, 20 years down the line, I'm not somebody that's just going to be able to shut this off and not think about training anymore because I'm, you know, retired or whatever. So what does it look like? You know, do I want to be on the floor as much as I am now? Probably not. But how can I, like you alluded to, stay relevant and continue to make some money and mentor the next generation of coaches? So I think that's where, regardless of where you're at in this, whether you're 25, 45, 65, like start to think about if you are going to be in this game, for 20 plus years, how are you going to evolve? How are you going to continue to grow so that you can stay relevant and continue to uh, just get better, right? Get better as a coach and and do things that make an impact on the world. For sure. And you know, part of it is obviously continuing to educate ourselves and, um, you know, building the tool, toolkit. And then 
you know, I like to, to think that nowadays I like to go a little bit beyond, you know, the S and C, the fitness world to, to look at other, you know, um, sciences and see what I can bring into, in, into my practice to kind of enhance my, my delivery of, of content of, um, you know, things to basically kind of motivate general pop clients and also athletes, you know, to, to basically do what they need to do, what I know they need to do to stay healthy and, and successful, right. In the long term. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Have there been any big shifts or changes to your philosophy over the past one to two years? Well, I'd say, you know, it's, it's usually a gradual shift uh, when I think about, sure. when I think back about these things, but I'm, I've definitely moved to like, you know, when we talk about gym based stuff, I think um, I'm definitely not focused on strength. Like, and again, you know, obviously we've got several definitions of, of strength, but I really yeah. think for the population that I work with, you know, football, soccer players, it's something that I have to like, you know, top up and obviously have certain levels of strength, but I've definitely gone more towards the, you know, um, agility coordination side of things lately, very, um, um, using, I mean, I think looking back now, I used it a lot, um, anyway, but like, you know, the fascial based approach, uh, training athletes based on their needs. You know, most of the guys I, I will see are, you know, fashion driven athletes. And I, I know, you know, some people don't like that phrase, but it's like, you know, the, the, the springy athletes who just won't respond well to, to maximal, uh, strength loads. So yeah, I, I think that, and, um, yeah, just basically using every single client and athlete as an experiment and just building, you know, kind of their case study and, and working on their, you know, injury history and performance history and to build out programs for them where, where they're at right now. Um, and, you know, thankfully I've got some really good data now. I've been working with some of the national team football, soccer players for, um, like 12 years now. So I think that's a really good data set. Um, wow. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. It it's just interesting because, you know, certain terms get very buzzworthy, right? Like you hear a lot of people talking about fashionably driven athletes and you can say whatever you want about not liking it, but look, we've bucketed people into more like springy, elastic versus force based creatures for a long time now, right? A long time. So just because you don't like a certain term, that's okay. Like you don't have to agree. Like some people don't like Bill using wides versus narrow ISAs. It doesn't matter. As long as we have the same general framework and representation that we're speaking from, not everybody's going to agree on language or terminology, and that's okay. But by and large, we have to have an understanding of, look, certain athletes are built for the weight room, right? Certain athletes are built for like that fascial, elastic, uh, just kind of bouncy, reactive type of work. And just knowing, okay, well, these are their superpowers. And then how do we kind of plug the gaps, so to speak, or how do we fill in those gaps so that we can keep them healthy and performing at a high level. But I'm with you, man. It, the internet loves to make a big deal out of nothing when it comes to s and I'd say on, on that, I'd say two things. So one thing is it's got to be meaningful to them. And then the second thing is yeah. like, can we give them what they need, right? Or are we just a strength yeah. coach who will just put uh, a barber on their back, you know, no matter what? So, all right, I like, like you said, you know, I've got three or four bucks that I usually uh, place athletes in. All right. Can I give you what you need, and will you be able to perform on the pitch? That's you know, um, it, it's going to be evident, right? Pretty much. So, yeah. yeah. Over the long term, I think after ten years, you can say whether you've been successful with an athlete or not. And obviously, look, we're a small part of the um, of the puzzle, but I sure. think you know, we are we are an important stakeholder uh, nonetheless. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Last but not least, we got our lightning round, my friend. Five fairly short questions. Your answer can be as long or short as you like. Number one, arguably the most important to me, what's your current go-to coffee spot in Ljubljana? Oh, I actually just a couple of months ago, I switched to a new place. Uh, it's uh, called Specialka, so the special one, really, so specialty coffee. Okay. Um, it's in a redeveloped, like, um, old like bike factory um uh okay. so yeah it's uh good times but uh, you know i do my rounds like you know it's uh i don't i don't yeah. like to switch anyone off and um 
<laughs> yeah, there's an up and up and coming uh, specialty coffee uh, place for sure. So uh, okay. I've always got something going on. Uh, but yeah, that, that's I, the new one. Okay, I love it. Number two, what's the favorite? Your favorite book that you've read in the past year? That's a tough one. Um, I've been reading um, and rereading some of the Alan Watts stuff. Um, so I would say um, I've actually reread Behave um, mm, yeah. as well. And um, yeah, I'd, pro I'd probably say, I'd probably say that. Um, I'd probably say Behave. It's actually uh, somewhere around here. <laughs> I would say, yeah, I'll yeah. say Behave. Behave. Okay. Okay. Number three. You kind of mentioned this briefly. Talk to me about uh, your recent contribution to iFastU. Shameless plug here, people. Matei, what did you talk about? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, yeah, I was, again, I was honored to, to be asked on. Thanks again for that, for the opportunity. But um, yeah, I was talking yeah. about what we essentially covered uh, briefly over, over the course of our talk. So basically how to organize uh, training for specifically for off-season uh, for soccer players when you've got such time constraints as we have. So, you know, talking four to six weeks, basically how to organize the training um, and what kind of elements to focus on, given that you can't just, you know, throw everything uh, at them. You're looking at specific adaptations, right? So just kind of broke, yeah. bro brought it, uh, broken it down to uh, coincide with the gate cycle, which, uh, which I've kind of taken um, partly from Bill's work um yeah. working quite a bit with uh em katanids uh as well and uh yeah they've been influential over the last couple of years in, in that space and then yeah from what i've seen um it's been working um players are healthy and you know performing well so um yeah get a get on get on that i think i think it was a, a decent prezo uh yeah uh, and uh i think you know especially i think people will, will look at that and say okay that's maybe something different. Maybe I want to try that given what I've got, uh, the, the time constraints uh, that I have. Working yeah, with these I think it's a brilliant way to organize. I think it's a brilliant way to organize an off season. And again, based on the short duration of time, you're trying to get this really focal adaptation in each of those little windows. Um, granted, I'm biased because I think you and I are pretty similar in our approach at this point. But uh, yeah, again, shameless plug, $47.00. You can get not only access to Matei's presentation, but all of the current iFastU presentations. So check that out. Uh, number four, serious question. Any tips for helping Luca chew out the next time I see him? How, how can we ramp him down? Uh, I don't know. Just give him something to smoke, man. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, he's, he, is, uh, he has switched from monster to coffee. So, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That's that true. Point. Yeah, he he's doing. He he has taken that step. He's bitten that bullet. Um, so um, uh, kudos to him. Um, I think yeah. Uh, I I've treated him to a couple of float tanks before. So uh, I think oh yeah, that would be huge. that would be a good one. Um, man, peace of mind is a sought after commodity in that human. So you know, I think uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't I don't want him to slow down, um, even though I do. Uh, so, but you know, he's, yeah. he's going to have to kind of, you know, find that, uh, find that tempo adaptation himself. But, um, yeah, I yes. mean, what, what he's doing by the way is, is nothing short of amazing the way, uh, he grinds through and, um, all the content, the content and value he delivers to people. So yeah, uh, hats off to yeah. him. Agreed. The last time we were there, me, him, Joel and Ariel went to, uh, this place called the hot house. So next time we're in Seattle, okay. I've heard great things about Banya. Never been to Banya, the yeah. Russian bathhouse, yeah, yeah, yeah. but the hot house is amazing. Literally, there's like a hot tub, there's a dry sauna, a wet sauna, like a cold shower. So you can just kind of cycle through the three. Man, most relaxed I've been in quite some time. Highly recommend if you're ever in Seattle. And I don't get oh, I don't definitely. get promoted. I don't get a I don't get any uh, money for that. But the hot house was pretty nice. <laughs> okay, <laughs> last but not least, man. What's next for Matei Hosovar, man? What are you working on? What are you excited about? Anything. Okay, so this is something that we didn't speak about um, before, but um, it's actually more like in, into the diving into the health side of uh, our industry because, um, so I've got a, starting actually a project 
um, that will look into some um, training adaptations for people with Parkinson's disease. Uh, I don't know if anyone's really? uh, aware, but both of my parents have Parkinson's. And so it's something that hits close to home. And um, I've decided yeah. to do some, you know, research and, uh, and trying to get um, some people who, who are suffering from disease and trying to prove, which I think I'll, I'll be able to that <clears throat> with uh, specific exercise uh, interventions, like you know, specific strength training and uh, particularly aerobic um, adaptations will help their symptoms. So I'm trying to partner up with mm-hmm. some of uh, some companies that do embedded EMG and, um, some um so um brain imaging which will basically provide us with uh, data on dopamine levels which is kind of like a kpi yeah. for, for for parkinson's disease so apart from obviously the stuff that i've got going on with 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 the soccer um that's something that i'm kind of passionate about going into the second part of the year this year and looking for yeah. some partners um for some partners in that space i've got some uh very exciting uh, meetings coming up and um yeah so that that's something to look out for other than that you've got quite a few requests for consulting mentoring um both domestically from within slovenia and also we've uh, we've been invited f- uh, or you know um, we're, we're talking about whether we'll come to them or they'll come to us but you know uh, trainers coaches from different european countries so that's exciting as well that's you know cool. to kind of get recognition from people who are looking at you from afar and um have recognized the value that they feel we provide um so i'm looking forward to that and um yeah i guess you know just um obviously definitely last but not least you know i'm uh, probably going to just get that one shot at being a dad so um you know don't want to uh, yeah. let that one fly and um yeah just trying to give um the time and attention that I feel, um, you know, uh, the little human deserves. So uh, just trying to be yes. present there on, on a daily basis. Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, I guess I love it, man, especially at four, dude, enjoy the snuggles. Oh yeah. Snuggles aren't there forever, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I still I, get a few from Cade, but man, he's 10. I'm, I'm, I'm worried once those are gone, I don't know what I'm going to do. My wife's going to be annoyed. I'm just going to like want to cling to her all the time. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, you know, it's 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 a pretty golden period right now. I'm, tr- I'm trying yeah. to kind of stay cognizant of that. And then, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to cherish it. And also, you know, trying to spend time uh, with the family whenever I can. So, yeah. I love it, man. I love it. Dude, so much respect for you, what you're doing. You are one Thank of you. my best friends in this industry. And I just appreciate you on so many levels. So, with that being said, Matei, where can my listeners find out more about you and all the great work you're doing? Well, first of all, appreciate you, Mike. Uh, right back at you, man. I mean, uh, you've been hugely influential on on my career and my development. So, you know, without you, much of this wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be possible. So, thank you as well. Uh, but yeah, um, socials. I'm. I guess I'm decently um, uh, active on Instagram. Um, I am on Twitter, but I'm pretty much behind the scenes there um i'll try i actually try to be more more active there but yeah you can find me on instagram um and then um yeah our website but i think instagram is probably the place to, to go to see uh what i've got going on perfect and obviously yeah. i fast you from my app now and i fast you i'll make sure i put all of those in the show notes i fast you is actually going to sponsor this episode so a couple of shameless plugs in here. But Matei, <laughs> again, this was amazing, man. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you again.